And we're back again. Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, I've escaped my building. Which website? Well, the one where you do the live stream. Oh. Or all your, all your stuff. Oh, okay. I got, I got a few. Um, U S T R E A. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's some uh, live streaming right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. Uh, use U S T R E. Dot A M. Dot A M. Yeah. Dot A M. Okay. Then dash. Yeah, slash. Slash. So forward slash. Right. Uh, capital N. N, and capital N, yeah. Little H, little U, capital D. Capital D. Oh. Capital yeah, N, yeah. lowercase H, U, and capital D. Yeah. Okay. And that's just, or you can use ustream.tv slash channel. Ustream.tv slash channel. Slash Freeman Sullivan. Freeman Sullivan. And that's how you reach this channel that I'm broadcasting from. Alright, cool. And I've got a I got a channel. Just uh, Google Freeman Sullivan, and there's two good, two different. Uh, there'll be a company, and there'll be me. And so, you know, I'm not the company. Freeman Sullivan. Two words. Uh, one word. One word. And it'll come up all my various web web things. And for people there, what's your first name? Clark. Clark. Okay. Yeah. I'm Chris. Okay. That's going to be interesting about apartheid. Whoever's yeah, yeah. lecturing, because I was there. <laughs> So, oh really? Yeah, I was there organizing. I was part of it. One so, thing I was wondering is, uh, is if I'd see you again here because I was. I remember you were talking about going traveling. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting, getting ready to move to New York. Okay. Yeah, in a few months. Are you, what are you talking about going like somewhere in uh, Latin America or something? Yeah, I'm going to get out of Mexico. Sounds great. For uh, solstice. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, we were talking about Terrence. Yeah, December 21st is coming. Actually, I've been writing a lot in my journal about Terrence McKenna. I, was, I also belong to a couple of local... Uh, well, he's like, the first person to turn uh, Westerners onto the date, right? You mean... Uh, December 21st, 2012, yeah, yeah. Right. right. Which I don't know what's going to happen, but supposedly, according to the Mayans, we're going to experience 20 or 30 hours of darkness. According to the latest... According to who? The Mayans. The Mayan who, elders. Who, who, oh, right. okay. They have the knowledge about what happened. that are alive now, or...? Yeah, that are alive okay. now, but they've been passing this down for generations, and, and they Terrence, were the last. Terrence McKenna thinks it's going to be the end of history. Well, yeah. And time. Well, I don't know about time. Well, I mean, he thinks. Well, wait, well he, what he, yeah, he never thought that. No. He never what? He never thought that specifically. It might be no, the he, end of history. Well, he, later he said he he took it. He might he might be wrong, but his theory is that all time beginning with the Big Bang even is going to end on December twenty first. Huh. I think it's I think it's maybe his biggest mistake. And, yeah. And, uh, I'm a big fan, but um, yeah, I think I, it's kind of weird. It is very weird. I think it might be one of those things from doing too much drugs and uh, getting inflated ideas. That's his word, actually, inflated ideas. He may be victim of his own. What do you think? 
Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah. Anyway. But I belong to a couple, like, local, uh, like, psychedelic groups and show them some of their things. There's, some, there are, there, there's a couple on uh, meetup.com. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? Have you seen that? Just something called the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. They have some interesting talks and stuff. You said they're two, the one that is not a company or something, right? Right. Okay. Which I did work for them at one time. That's how I got the, that's why I decided to take the name. Oh, okay. Hey, Thomas. What's your first name again? Clark. Clark. Yep, oh. Clark. So uh, I can go here later and view our discussion that's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to see yourself again, yes. Maybe you hope. I'm in a vain mood. Yeah, everything gets archived. I don't like, I get to the point where I don't like to see myself or hear myself on my, my stuff I do. That's why I'm glad it's live streams because I don't have to edit it. Right. I might want to pull out a, every once in a while there might be a highlight, but I don't make it for highlights. I don't, it's not, you know, it's just to do video, just to do video is not something I'm really interested in doing. But I like the fact that you can live stream stuff live as it's happening to people. Even if like hardly anybody's watching it, it's still out there, going out there in the world, you know. It's really interesting. It's definitely uh, going to be something new that hasn't really happened before. And, uh, you know, has, technology has its pros and cons. It can be misused and, uh, and used to really bad. Reason. But um, definitely after I talked to you last time, I was, I was thinking of getting one of these phones. And, uh, I've seen, I've seen guys in the Occupy movement like strap it to their backpack or something so it's just like slot in You can do that I guess but I'll go with Metro. Yeah, that's where I looked at the phone. Went for the same one. They had some LG for like 150 bucks. I don't think it was just one, but it was just one. It was some new one that just came out. Oh. Or, I mean, this was like a couple of weeks ago, but... Uh, and they had some new plan. Like, uh, 55 bucks a month. Nah, there's only one plan that they give you unlimited uh, uh, streaming with $71 a month. What do you mean unlimited streaming? Well, you get unlimited bandwidth. Oh. Yeah. Right. yeah, if you're gonna like do it more than just one day, one time a month. You know, there might be, there might be some new, some new plan. Um, just that is unlimited. You might want to check out. I've actually, I actually had Metro before. And when they come out with new plans, sometimes they don't tell you, and they just keep you on the old one to try and hate it. You might want to ask about. Yeah, I already asked them about oh, that. Okay, yeah. So this is it, right? Because um, I was like, I only did about six hours of the streaming, and I'm like. And I get this notice that I have a bandwidth limit. And that wasn't what I signed up for when I originally signed up. You know. So, but as long as they keep the bill at 71 bucks a month, I guess I'll have to live with it. You know. I don't want to keep a phone. But in New York, uh, the same plan works, so. And cell phone reception there is generally better. How about when you go out of the country? That doesn't, I'm not, you have to have a satellite phone if you want to do any streaming for that. Yeah. Most things happen in the city anyway, so. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're glad everybody's watching. We're getting ready to have Occupy the Forum here at Bradley Manning Plaza in San Francisco. And if you're in the area, drop by. Uh, we're right at the foot of Market Street. You can take any, uh, pretty much any public transit. We'll take you down in this area. So uh, do drop by. We'll be here until nine o'clock, eight o'clock tonight, nine o'clock. Tonight's topic is on apartheid. So I uh, know it's the movement. It'll be interesting. I'll have to compare notes because I was there at uh, for the anti-apartheid movement in the University of California <clears throat> back in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, we weren't bound by nonviolence. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. our confrontations with the police were a lot more violent than the ones today. Anyway, we're competing with the baseball game here tonight. That's San Francisco Giants on, so we'll see what kind of crowd we get. And they're all playing about less than a mile away. That's the weather's nice. Not too cold like it usually is in the evenings around in San Francisco. So if you'd like to say anything or ask any questions, uh, just log on to the social stream or the chat and communicate with me. I'd love to talk with my viewers. It's always a good thing. Let everybody know about this live stream. And if you'd like to contact me, uh, tweet me. You can do that at Freeman Sullivan. F-R-E-E-M-A-N-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N. Our usual spot. We should be back here in here this Saturday, uh, right across the street over here at One Market is the headquarters of Salesforce, uh, America's uh, leading surveillance organization, or they want to be, uh, where they can take all the information off of CCTV and use it against you and uh, plot your directions, where you're at, uh, what you did at a certain time, all that. So uh, we'll be having a demonstration on October 20th. Uh, at the Federal Building, uh, Department of Homeland Security, um, on uh, Operation Trap Wire. Uh, it's one uh, event that I've pretty much organized completely on Facebook with a bunch of other people. But uh, we're going to be down there at the Federal Building at 450 Golden Gate at 11 a.m., 10 to 11 a.m. And uh, then we'll be heading down here to Salesforce. So uh, mark that on your calendars. And uh, that'll be uh, we'll be at Salesforce around 1 p.m. Excuse me. Uh, we should be starting about 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you all for watching. I only got out of the house. I was a prisoner in my place for about a week. The elevator was out. So getting in and out of uh, the building has been a real, real adventure. I had a real adventure getting out of the building today, as a matter of fact. So, geez. Mobility is definitely an issue.
Starting in a few minutes, folks. the forum here at Bradley Manning Plaza in San Francisco at the foot of Market Street and the Embarcadero we're right by the
a bunch of mine workers the uh, day before yesterday. They fired all the diamond mine workers the day before yesterday. And the company fired like 1,500 workers. Uh, they went on strike? That was the ones that all got murdered. And then they tried to put them on trial for, uh, for uh, starting the whole thing that precipitated it, saying that they were responsible for all the deaths. There was like 170 people that were killed. Right? It's about two months ago in South Africa. Yeah, where's our speaker at? Yeah, it'll be good to keep paradise. Right? to compare notes. I was there. I was there for the anti-apartheid movement. I got arrested a couple of times. Yeah, I didn't do much on that one. I have to confess. I've done a lot of activism, but I kind of sat that one out. Well, most of it here revolved around the ILWU, and they didn't want to unload any cargo that came from South Africa. And that started, there was a couple of incidents. There was one incident, I think it was in 1982, where there was a ship come on, and they actually went on strike to not to unload it, and then they were forced to by federal injunction. So I was with a group called Campaign Against Apartheid, right, which like, uh, David Sullivan was then part of it. And, uh, we did a blockade of Pier 80 down at, uh, back when they, when they were unloading ships down there. They had a ship come in, it was a, a Dutch ship that had South African cargo. And, At any rate, we kept the ship from getting unloaded by creating a hazardous condition for the dock workers, just like they did down at uh, the strike over in Oakland. A little background for all you viewers about what's going on. Hey, what's up? Top of the bed. Not much just out here. I probably got out of my building. Uh, the elevator wasn't working, and I had all these live streams planned, and I couldn't go out and do them because I had a hard time getting in and out of my building. So I'm glad to be back and uh, glad to be live streaming again. So thanks for watching, everybody, and for showing your support. Uh, we're down here at the Bradley Manning Plaza here in beautiful downtown San Francisco. should be starting here in a minute or two. There's a little bit of a background. And then when I was down at Pier 80, we actually stopped a, this guy had a tractor trailer, and he was intent upon running us over. Uh, and he had like, I guess it was, you know how big an 18 wheeler is? Well, with 35 people, we were able to push his tractor trailer backwards while he was in it, gutting the engine. And we actually whipped at the cab up off the ground and bounced his head off of the ceiling of the cab. That was 35 people. So that was real human power. And uh, the strike guy came out uh, from the uh, from the board commission and ruled that there uh, wasn't going to be any work done that day. And uh, meanwhile, in the course of this, I was destroying the tractor trailer's tires, and they got me uh, and arrested me. But uh, the whole thing actually got going when uh, they were trying to arrest this guy named Mike, who was a friend of mine at the time. And if you're out there, Mike, props to you, brother. Uh, they wouldn't, he, they wouldn't, uh, couldn't get him in the back of the uh, paddy wagon. And they were beating him over the head. And I didn't like the fact that one of the lady cops was striking him on the back of the head, literally trying to crush, break his skull. And I grabbed the nightstick away from him and threw it on the ground. And they got me for inciting a riot, uh, resisting arrest, assault on a police officer, and lynching, which has been my big claim to fame here as an organizer in getting arrested and uh, by the time I got down to the jail and booked they had already dropped the charges because uh, you see the city of San Francisco had voted not to uh, do business with any businesses that were uh, engaged in trading with South Africa so they had to let them drop the charges because that law stuck and took precedence over what happened down at the port that day so I was never charged with anything but 
whenever I get stopped by a police officer, the assault thing comes up immediately, and they always back off a little bit. So. I think it should be here any minute. Testing, testing. Here it is. Okay, everybody, we're going to start. Connie, come down. Welcome to Forum in the Park. Um, 
Hello, everybody. You guys ready? Okay. Have a seat. down into the middle please so that we're all together can you guys move down we've got blankets and things to sit on yes come on down don't be shy so our our topic tonight is strategies and tactics of the anti-apartheid movement bringing down an immoral system and we have with us connie field who did the um, movie, Have You Heard From Johannesburg, which is about the anti-apartheid movement, the many-faceted anti-apartheid movement, and all the different strategies and tactics that people used across the globe to bring down that system. And we think it's very applicable for us because we also have a system that we think needs to change completely. And uh, we could adopt some of those same ideas and learn for what they did. So without much further ado, here's Connie Field. Hi. Hi, Connie. Hi, Connie. I have to stand up? Yeah. Oh, no, I'll give energy. Uh, <laughs> okay. right, I'll give energy. Okay. All right. um, listen, since we're such a small group, I mean, I sort of don't want to start at the beginning. I presume everybody here knows what apartheid was in South mm -hmm. Africa. Yes, so I don't have to go into that. Um, I don't know whether you know that the movement, the international movement against apartheid was the most globalized human rights move movement of the last century. I mean, it was the biggest international movement we've ever had. So it, it was actually very, very significant. And <clears throat> one of the things that I always think about with it is that um, it started really at the beginning of, of the last century. And it, that last century was really about getting rid of racism and colonialism. That was really the, the big social push throughout that entire um, century. And, and our part of it here was the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why everybody was so interested in ending apartheid in South Africa, because it was like the last domino to fall. And what I see now is that this century is really about ending poverty. There are groups all over the world trying to do that and to bring more, you know, <coughs> social, um, economic equality to all the countries all over the world. So <coughs> I have a pretty positive perspective on it because the last century succeeded in a lot of ways in dealing with race and colonialism all over the world. And I think we can make great, great headway in dealing with the others. But probably one of the most important lessons of this movement for anyone is that you have to have the patience of the long distance runner. These things take a long time. Um, and it was not only people inside South Africa who dedicated their entire lives to getting rid of apartheid and bringing democracy to South Africa, which is what the movement was about, but people in the rest of the world did that. They dedicated their entire lives to do this. And um, I think that probably um, some of the most significant things that you can learn from that movement, one is the importance of leadership. It had very, very good leadership. Most liberation movements that were in exile, they failed or they, they fell apart and they argued with each other and they didn't get anywhere. And because they had an extraordinary leader in a man named Oliver Tambo, who most of the world knows only as an airport now in Johannesburg, um, he's the one who led the whole, you know, the ANC in exile for 30 years. He managed to keep people together. He managed to be, he was a great diplomat. The other thing they did that I think is really, really important is that they learned to work on all different levels. You don't just work on one level. They worked with the United Nations. They worked with citizens groups in countries. 
they worked with governments they had they had they worked on every single level they worked in the underground in south africa they worked with communities there because often and especially when in a system like we've got where you you there really isn't the voice of the people in any of our politics um it's very very easy to just say let's just forget about that and we need to have a complete revolution well that's true but it's going to take a really long time before that happens and it's going to take a lot of organizing and in the meantime functioning at least going out to vote is extremely important um and so that's one of the big lessons is learning how to work on different levels you choose maybe the place where you want to be but you also participate in other things that are working on different levels um, and the other thing that, that they did with this movement, the whole notion of to be global but act locally was very much a part of this movement. People did the things they could do in their countries, where their country had the strongest link, where, um, um, and that was very, very important. And <coughs> one of the main strategies of that particular movement in terms of overthrowing apartheid was to isolate the South African regime. That was key. That's what the international community was asked to do. They were asked to do it culturally, politically, and economically. And they succeeded in doing it on all those different levels in different ways. And one of the most important things they did in this country is we, we had the most successful divestment campaign in the world. We had that because we were the most, most privatized Western country. Places in Europe are social democracies. People's pensions come from the government. We have everything privatized in America. And because of that, we could leverage that, influence that, on every single level. The divestment as a tactic that was used in very successfully in the 70s and 80s in this country is extremely important to look at because it was a tactic it was that everyone could do. You need to come up with things that people can do everywhere. This is something you could do with your through your union, through your city council, through your university, everywhere people were, they had access to finance that was invested in businesses that were doing business with South Africa. And it just grew, it became the movement in America in the 1980s. And it changed what our federal government did. It was enormous. So like for, for Occupy, if you're gonna think about what you did one thing absolutely brilliantly, and that was to, to bring to the attention the problem and the slogan of the 99%. That was absolutely brilliant that that got done. Sitting in the parks to get media attention for that was also very important. But that's, again, only gonna last so long. The idea is gonna stick, but it's important to think about what can you do that people can do all over. And one of the key things that it seemed people could do is work around foreclosures. People's homes are getting foreclosed all over America, in every city, in every town. That means that can be like what the divestment movement was. Okay, something that people can work on all over. And a movement needs to have that in order to both have an impact, keep your message clear, and get your movement growing. So um, those are some, of, in a nutshell, the important things. And Ruthie had asked me specifically to talk about violence and nonviolence, because I know that that's kind of been a debate in the Occupy movement. And <clears throat> what happened in the situation in South Africa, the African National Congress had a guerrilla army. They had one because everybody else all over Africa did. It was a very logical thing to do during that time. A few things happened about their army. One, the fact of having it, um, the West would not give them arms, so they had only the choice of going to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the one who was supporting liberation movements in Africa, and their guns are left all over Africa, which are creating a mess today. 
Um, and that put the ANC right in the middle of the Cold War. They would have been historically a lot more successful earlier had they not done that. Okay? But I totally understand why they did it. It was very logical why they would do that. In terms of what really affected change in South Africa, it wasn't the little acts of sabotage. It was really the non-violent movement. It was a mass movement in South Africa that rose up in the 80s in a way that the government could not put it down. And it was the international community that had put so much pressure on South Africa that that combination forced them to change. Everyone thought it was going to be a bloodbath. Everybody thought that. Nobody also thought it was going to end as early as it did. It was not a bloodbath because, and, uh, and the ANC understood this, and also that's why they, they really organized on an international level. They were up against the strongest army on the entire continent. They never could have won that militarily. It would not have been possible. When you can't win things militarily in any way, you're stronger if you use nonviolence. You're much stronger. And people make this mistake all the time. They're violent, so why can't we be violent? People make a mistake about thinking nonviolence means peace. You hear people talk about it all the time, peace and nonviolence. Nonviolence is not peace. Nonviolence is warfare, but it's done nonviolently and strategically. And when you can do that, you can have enormous success. That's what brought success to the civil rights movement in this country. It was not the Black Panthers. It was not Stokely Carmine. Those things actually changed nothing in America. This is historically what happened. The civil rights movement that was nonviolent did. It brought through the legislation where we have the Voting Rights Act, where we have the civil rights, and then all the major changes that happened, happened because of that. So it's really important to look at that. It's important to be strong enough to be strategic, not to just let your anger, <laughs> you know, take the brunt of it. And remember, all you're fighting here is the police. They're just symbolic of the system. They are not the system. And you are not fighting the system when you're fighting them. Though I certainly understand, um, <clears throat> you know, that that happens all the time, and it's <laughs> hard not to get into those situations. And when you're building big enough demonstrations, things will happen. But it, but it was not the violent um, uh, things that helped South Africa that won that. It was not what's won the civil rights movement in this country. And it's really, really important. You need to actually be stronger to be nonviolent than you need to be someone who can run around and throw bricks in store windows. Okay? It's just the truth. Um, and. <clears throat> Um, so, so those, to my mind, were the important things that I learned in doing this film series, um, which is about all of that. And since you're such a small group, it'd be, it'd be better if people just ask questions because you're so small. What would you like to talk about? I know that um, in your film, there's a whole section about soccer in South Africa and boycotts of like oranges and things like that and i'm wondering if you can take some of those examples and explain them in some detail um, so the, one, the first thing that the international community um, community did one of the very first things was boycott south african products okay there were a lot of oranges this was this was very true in in europe especially in this country, we didn't get much from South Africa. We just got lobster tails, and nobody could figure out how to build a mass movement around boycotting lobster tails, which is why the United States came up with boycotting banks and ending loans to South Africa. That got started, that notion here in America in the 60s. It was incredibly important because actually in 1985, when Chase Manhattan refused to roll over loans to the South African government based on not only pressure from this country and other countries, but also because of the movement inside South Africa, it looked like they were going to lose their loans. That actually was one of the key things that happened. That was kind of the death knell to the economy in South Africa. Um, all of these countries, our government, as you know, were owned by China. 
you know, this country lives totally off of loans, so did South Africa. That's how all the economies worked. That's why coming up with an idea in the 60s to end loans finally ended up happening in 1985, and it was one of the absolutely key things that changed things in that country. And I have this straight from the mouth of the Minister of Finance for the Afrikaner regime. So it's, it's, now, but what, um, what boycotting products did, it didn't really affect South Africa. What it did do is allow people in their communities and cities and towns to talk to their populations about South Africa and about what was wrong with it. So it built the movement. It didn't affect South Africa, it built the movement, and that was really, really important. The, yeah, the sports boycott that <coughs> um, Muthi was mentioning, one of the ways, one of the most cu important cultural ties that South Africa had with the rest of the world was sports. They were really good at it. And they were the best in rugby. Did anybody see that, yeah, that, I saw it. that film? Okay. Um, they were the world's best in rugby. The sport, so the sports boycott was one of the most important cultural boycotts. Um, I don't feel that the other cultural boycotts really were very successful or that they're necessarily a good idea. But that's a whole other discussion. And, and they didn't have much of an impact on South Africa. But sports really did. It's a sports mad society. Um, they first, in, the, in this, uh, it's the sports boycott, they first were able actually to stop things at international levels. Because even though Africa was a growing power in the General Assembly at the United Nations, it had no power in the UN, because nobody has any power at the United Nations except for the, the countries that have veto power on the Security Council. I'm sure, do all of you understand that, about that's what controls the United Nations? No, does everybody, I think people know it. But it could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. The way the United Nations <coughs> is run, okay, you have a general assembly and everybody there has a vote, okay, all, all the different countries. And you can pass a million resolutions, which they do. There were more resolutions passed condemning South Africa and apartheid than anything in the world was passed, but it didn't really mean anything. It meant something morally. They deemed, you know, apartheid to be a crime against humanity, which it was. But the way the UN works is you can only implement things really from the Security Council. The Security Council has five permanent members. That's it. These permanent members get to veto. All it takes is one veto from one of those members to make something not happen. Then it's also made up, then there's sort of other countries are on also the Security Council, there's kind of a revolving door of other countries, but they don't have veto power. Veto power is with who do you think? Who do you think has veto power? In the United States, Germany, France. Not Germany. No, Germany doesn't have it. Remember World War II? Oh. Remember when there's a... Oh, they'll never do it. Yeah, okay, so, so go ahead. The United States. Uh, doesn't Japan or Russia? The Soviet, Soviet Union. Union. Yes. The United States. China. Okay. It's France, Britain, the United Britain. States, Russia from the Soviet Union, and, and China. China. Okay. okay. Why is that? They pretty much control the world. Yeah. And they don't want to not control it. Wow. And this is what unfortunately makes the UN, which could be a wonderful thing, not very functional. Yeah. Okay? So it's, um, but Africa... <coughs> was very, very, very important to international sports. I mean, they had the best runners in the world. I mean, it's, it's so, <clears throat> they were very, very strong. And because Africa was so strong, they were able to get, eventually, South Africa kicked out of the Olympics. They got them kicked out of every major international sporting body in the world. Every single one of them on an international level, out, except one, and that was rugby, okay? And they, because the rugby playing countries, which were, the, their biggest rivals were Britain, Australia, and New Zealand especially, um, wouldn't go along with it. 
because they couldn't. So what happened with rugby um, is it was it was citizens in those countries, citizens in Britain, who um, staged such wide civil disobedience that their government could not afford to ever let it happen again. The police departments didn't want to deal with it. And uh, Britain succeeded in having the last rugby game there in 1969. That was it. Wow. And then South Africa never was able to come back to Britain. Wow. Now, this didn't mean that the British team didn't sometimes go to South Africa. Okay, what the people were able to do is not let South Africa come to Britain. They did the same thing in Australia in 1971. And then the hardest place was New Zealand, because that country is really rugby mad. But they finally did it in 1981. And they did it by basically um, civil disobedience around the rugby games and running out on the fields and doing all kinds of things to make it impossible for them to play and, and to make chaos for the countries. And that really affected white South Africans. That made them really feel the isolation. They did not other ways, but this was so important to them that it really, really affected them. So it was, it was absolutely crucial. Um, to do. So there's many, it just shows you how many different things you can do to create a change. And um, it's, uh, and they, so all these things were really very effective. Any other questions? So, so it's interesting. So it seems that you have to be um, particular about the situation because uh, isolation of Iraq was devastating on the population. And it's right, so it wasn't the same thing. So, I mean, what, if you can speak possibly to some of the differences there, that would be interesting. Okay. Well, a couple of things. I mean, it's, it's that, um, well, Actually, for the, for, for the people that we don't agree with in terms of what they were trying to do in Iraq, it was sort of effective, but it's not going to be, look, you can't do this with Darfur, okay? You cannot isolate Darfur, the government in Darfur, in the same way. It will not work, okay? What allowed this to work in South Africa was its very particular situation. It had a white population, a very unusual white population, who identified themselves as Africans. They were a combination of French Huguenot, Dutch, and German. Um, they were the poor whites of South Africa. The British were the rich whites of South Africa. Their entire uh, <coughs> movement of building an Afrikaner nation is to bring their poor people up and make them have a, a, a better society, okay? They're the ones who came up with the more stricter ideas of ideological apartheid. But it was the British that really set up separation, not, not them. So these were an unusual group of whites. They weren't like colonial whites. They weren't like the Portuguese in Angola who just all fled when it, everybody goes back to their mother country. These people felt that South Africa was their country. They didn't have any other place to go. These people also totally identified with the West. They identified culturally. They were totally economically allied with the West. So you could really influence, influence them by isolating them. OK, that isn't true of the government of Darfur. Um, it isn't true of a lot of places. So, so <clears throat> the lesson of that is you really have to be very specific. You can't do the same things that were done in the anti-apartheid movement, but you can you can learn from what about their tactics made it work. Okay, that's why I bring up the divestment. It was really important. So, well, sure. Well, I've thought about this a bit, and it seems to me that the fundamental difference between South Africa and embargoes on places like Iraq or Cuba was that South Africa was voluntary on the part of the people, whereas the other ones were imposed by the United States government unilaterally. So there's a, a very different, um, uh, you know, ethical uh, dynamics. 
contest. Yeah, it, it was, but, but it's like, it, wait, it's different sides of the battle. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the battle against Cuba are the people that we're battling now, okay? And the, and the, the people who did <clears throat> the sanctions against Iraq are very much the people that we're battling now. It's different sides of the political spectrum, and that's really the big the difference. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the internal organizing within South Africa, because you talked a lot about the international pressure. But um, one of the issues we have within Occupy is the factionalization and different groups wanting to use different strategies. How did they internally in South Africa unite to you know, come together and organize from within? Leadership, leadership. There, there were great leaders in this movement, many of whom spent most of their life in jail, like Nelson Mandela. <clears throat> they had a very capable group of leaders, both inside and outside. That's why I mentioned Oliver Tambo. Um, it's, it's <coughs> something has to give a movement an overall direction. Okay, and and you have to have an organization. It's it's really um, as wonderful as notions are about anarchism or everybody just go off and do their own thing and it's all going to work and it'll be fine. That actually politically doesn't work. I think a lot of things. One thing I was going to say in terms of. <coughs> of working on different levels. Look, I think there's a lot of things that go on in a movement that build community for the movement, and that's very important. I think those things are really crucial. Um, in, in our movements of the 60s, um, the fact that we had such an incredible community, you know, it kept us focused, healthy, and we had our place where we lived in the midst of a society that we didn't agree with. That's important, but that's what that's for. It doesn't help politically in terms of what you're fighting, all right? And what helped the ANC was their leadership. The Pan-African Congress, there was a breakaway in South Africa um, in the, um, actually in 1959, there was a break between the ANC and a group form called the Pan-African Congress. Now, what this break was about is that the, the ANC um, worked with white people. They worked with Indians. They believed in a non-racial society. Um, the Pan-African Congress were, were Pan-Africanists. That was the thing that was actually ide ideologically going all over Africa. And it was a race-based Africa is for Africans ideology. They split on this. Um, it was actually the Pan-African Congress that did the one of the most famous um, <coughs> uh, protests that happened in South Africa in 1960 called Sharpville. And it's where they were, they, they did the same inside South Africa, they were using the same tactics. People were marching down and turning in their passes. People, black people needed passes to go anywhere. It was illegal not to have them. And so, um, and s over 72 people were sh gunned down. That event changed how the entire world looked at South Africa. It was really seminal. And that event was organized by the PAC. But what happened to that organization, because it didn't have the same kind of leadership, it ended up um, uh, getting in faction fights and basically falling apart. That's what happens. It happens to movements all the time. One of the hardest jobs you're going to have is to keep your movement together and not let it get factionalized. It's very hard. And usually it, that happens if you can have good leadership. It doesn't have to be all in one person. But as I mentioned before, Oliver Tambo was an extraordinary leader on many, many, many different levels. Because faction fighting, all it does is break down your movement and make you weaker. And <coughs> it's, um, so um, that's what happened in South Africa. That's why 
the a and c was able to maintain itself after all all these years the other thing i want to say about the n c is that remember they were a liberation movement their movement was focused on ending apartheid and bringing democracy to south africa they did not have a revolution they didn't have one there's certainly many people inside the nc who wanted that there's a million complicated reasons why that didn't happen okay and and part of that i believe is the fall of the berlin wall and the fact that communism as an ideology just went by the wayside in one fell swoop you know also they made decisions they didn't want to have um <coughs> things happen like happened in the portuguese colony where the entire economy fell apart and the ANC started making its deals with major international corporations beginning in the middle 80s. Um, so, so it's important, I always tell people when they're very disappointed what's going on in South Africa now, that they didn't have a revolution. That they had a movement that was focused on ending apartheid, bringing democracy, and they won that. And that was very hard to do. So now they have a different battle inside the country. And that, and, and I also try to tell people don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, ANC really, I think, was a brilliant liberation struggle. They did incredible things we can all learn from. They are not perfect, and that ne didn't necessarily set them up to lead their country perfectly. It's, there's really two different things between fighting a system bringing it down and creating a new one that's really equitable. There are two different stories there and they take very different skills. So, any other questions? Any questions I may have had are simply answered in the near future. Um, I'd like to know a little more about like the chronological progression of the movement and like the different stages of the movement. Well, this goes way back. This movement started <coughs> in uh, 1910 <laughs> when the ANC was formed. And what they did is they started out just going and they were they dressed in suits and they went to England to petition the government. To petition their government for more of their, to petition the British for more of their rights. That, of course, got them nowhere. Um, and they formed... Um, the ANC, um, <coughs> it's too long, it's a really long story, so I don't quite know how to, to, to tell that. And also my film was about what people did outside of South Africa, how we built the movements in, in our country. They were movements. They, they were, um, as one person has told me, that the anti-apartheid movement became people's own movements in their own country. It was just not connected to the, the ANC. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, and it, it's, I'm not sure it's going to be so helpful. What they were up against and what we're up against here now is very, very different. And what we're up against here. Whoa. 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 What are you doing? Jack, you know what? She's a snitch. We're not going to accept it in so.
back here to our talk here in a second. Evidently some dude just walked up and grabbed this woman who was here by the hair or ripped out one of her dreads. So we don't know much beyond that. That came kind of out of nowhere too. You guys, can you, can you gather again? We're going to continue. The divestment movement. Back again. Okay, it's um, you can learn a lot about how movements have been built in this country. There's lots of books that are written. There's lots of people that talk about them. Um, and <clears throat> but what's what's important is that, as I mentioned, if you can come up with a tactic that everybody can do, that means that it has potential success. Okay. Look, even in your own movement, remember when the Bank of America was adding 5% on something or other, I forget exactly what it was, and there was such a big uproar from everybody, it just stopped like that. You can complain a lot, and it only takes a small bit of you to do that, okay? And there's, um, and the, the key around the divestment move, first of all, the other thing is, and you've, you've done this already, it just... But it's maintaining the high moral ground. That's very important. That's why your, your tactics are important. And that's why you don't use violence just because you're having fun doing it. Okay? It, it doesn't give you good PR. It's not practical. And <clears throat> you need to think of things that are going to be practical. They're going to keep your message going and help you organize. That's why I met, I brought up the foreclosures. People started to do that. And I was hoping that this was going to become the next big movement in Occupy. And everybody was going to go focusing on that. It keeps you the high moral ground. It, it keeps your message going with each individual thing. And you can do it all over the states. But for some reason, that didn't happen. You know more about why it didn't happen than, than I do, because I haven't been in it. But it's, it's basically, um, the movement has to get to a point where you're functioning that way. You need to find things everybody can do. You need to find things that build your movement. Okay, and um, everything else um, is not quite going to do it. I mean, the divestment movement involved, you know, everybody involved city councilmen. It involved, um, you know, uh, governors, it involved universities, it involved union people, it involved everybody. That's what you want to do. If you really want to change America, you've got to involve a, a lot of people. But you can also change it with smaller amounts. And I don't know <coughs> um, if, if everybody, and maybe you guys poo-poo him or whatever, but actually Ralph Nader has been saying some really good things. And he's just come out with a new book. He's very practical, and it's a very good what he's saying. You can have a lot more influence than you think. And he's showing people exactly the way you can do it. And he's letting everybody know because <clears throat> Ruthie's husband just finished a film about, you know, the environmental movement. You know when we made our biggest successes in the environmental movement? You know when it was? It was in the 70s. And who was President Richard Nixon? How did that happen? That's important to look at. 
you know, and and it's and this is the whole thing about being able to function on different levels and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I and and I think we all want democracy, right? We don't not want democracy. So I think we want to make our democracy function better. And and that means we have to be functioning citizens in democracy. And he's just written a lot of really good things about it, which I think would be worth everybody's while here to read it and take it seriously. You know, the changes that we're trying to make in this country, people are trying to make, as you know, all over the world. And it's a, a big, big, hard struggle. Okay, Pro much harder than ending apartheid. And because everybody was against apartheid. Everybody's not against a capitalism. Capitalism allows all these things to happen as they're happening. But, you know, even though, <clears throat> but we can change things, and it's important to pick out things that can be good targets where where people will feel like fighting. That's why I mentioned foreclosures. That's a good community-based thing to do. And, uh, and fighting against Citizens United is very good to do because we can win that. We can win that. And it, it is, everybody knows now, it's it's horrendous. It's really, really bad. So it's, it's um, this isn't making the revolution. This isn't changing, you know, you're not going to change your immediate world for a long, very long time. It's just the truth of it. They, the ANC fought, fought since 1910 to overturn apartheid. It's really a long time. Um, and and also the other thing that I think is so good about foreclosures is happening all over the world. It's not just happening here. It's happening in Spain. It's happening everywhere. This is your community-based thing that everybody can do that will allow you to reach out to a community beyond yourselves. Because all the movements have to do that. When we built the women's movement in America, which I was a part of, we went out and we expanded who we reached. I mean, we had our little communities and um, we were all, and we were very tactical. We talked to them about women's issues. We didn't bring in the whole kitchen sink at once. But you have to expand. You have to keep bringing in more people in, into your movements to make it grow. And you have to have tactics that will allow you to do that. And foreclosures and Citizens United are two big branches. And what Ralph Nader is talking about is how each person in their community, what they did to change our environmental laws, and it took only a tiny, tiny percentage of the population to do it. Only tiny. So there's, there's a lot to learn from all of this. Well, backtracking a little to the history, and since we're on Anything? the topic, Thank uh, you. on the topic of nonviolence, um, Gandhi got his start in South Africa, yes, politically. Yes, he did. He was. South Africa has a lot of Indians. Back when I started making the film, I kept saying, I can't interview any more Indians. There's just too many Indians that we've got. There's a large population, especially in Durban, they were all brought in to um, work, especially in Durban, in the fields because it was a very hot, moist climate and that was like India and they were good workers. So Gandhi came around the turn of the century and he went to law school there, became a law lawyer and developed his entire nonviolent strategy in South Africa. That's really where it started. So, yes. Who did that? Yeah, unless So, um, I love the foreclosure work that's happening. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that. All right. Um, so the foreclosure work that's happening is amazing. It's really great. I encourage it. Um, keep it up. But it really doesn't address everybody. There's a lot of people that don't own homes. A lot of people that don't know what a foreclosure is. A lot of people that. Um, 